Artificial intelligence, AI, is technology that enables computers and digital devices to learn, read, write, create, and analyze. Let's bring in Professor Christopher Lamont, Deputy Head Program for Artificial Intelligence and Global Governance from the Global Governance Institute based in Brussels, Belgium, but he is currently in Tokyo, Japan. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. It is a real pleasure to be here. Okay, let's start the Global Affairs Insider. Where do we draw the line with the presence of artificial intelligence? Do you think that empirical evidence as based from AI will also change the landscape of its acceptability to social scientists or when it comes to database knowledge? On the other hand, what do you think is the future of public administration with artificial intelligence? And when is the future, what is the future gonna be like with all these things that, that is happening in, in our time? Yeah, this is um, interesting, right? Because you're asking a question that um, does touch on higher education and the social sciences and research. And as kind of for maybe some of your younger viewers might be aware that a lot of new tools have emerged that are easily accessible and that are for the most part free that allow people to, on the one hand, um, do things that um, we used to think um, would require a student to kind of read and go through a lot of literature, um, but on the other, you have you have now kind of these um, tools that are marketed as like kind of um, academic aids, right, or assistants that will um, go out and try to find literature, literature to create a literature review for you, or do something along the lines of assist you in the research process. And so there's this kind of ethical gray area that's emerging in terms of research practice as a lot of these technologies are moving faster in some cases than the ability of kind of national research societies to come up with answers to questions that students might have about the ethics of this. Now, one thing that um, I think is is very important, right? Is is that educate? Well, it's it's at the center of education, right? Is is about um, us, right? People, we're learning, and um, to the extent that you could have um, students producing assignments, right, without ever having kind of read or looked at something, submitting those assignments, and then on the other side, right, maybe having professors rely on artificial intelligence grading tools to, to read the assignments and provide feedback. Nobody, no human is actually doing anything. And that's actually, on the one hand, it's, it's kind of a joke, but on the other hand, it's also a, um, a, a word of caution in a sense for, for your viewers that this is not what AI should, how AI should be used in the context of Research now. On the one hand, right, you think about data analytics and data science. Um, there's a long history of using these tools. You might even think about something as simple as as regression, right, um, as a form of guided learning. Um, and the controversy that emerged when, for example, the calculator emerged and math teachers around the world were telling students like to to put this away. You're going to need to learn how to do this because you won't always have a calculator with you. But if you look at your cell phone in a way in 2024, you kind of do, right? Always have a calculator with you. But to be um, to get back to the the point here is is that to the extent that you're learning, and this gets back to this question of artificial intelligence literacy um, being so important, is that those who understand, if you if you understand kind of these logics and how these tools are producing things for you, you understand that it's it's based on a particular type of logic that's not necessarily going to provide you with the type of answer to the question that you have. 
And for those students who are interested in the social sciences out of a genuine sense or a burning sense of um, curiosity, or maybe a sense of, of injustice, right? Um, these types of tools that kind of just reproduce for you kind of what's generally out there are gonna be of limited value. So in some respect, kind of the, if you give some respects, if we are to look over the horizon and look at how the next generation of researchers and um, students are going to see these tools, right? They're in some respects gonna be everywhere. Um, even our search engines, right, are going to give us generative text, right? They already do. Um, but at the same time, I don't see it necessarily as something that is a threat to, to social science research in the sense that um, for those who kind of do research, right, we, we understand that the, the types of questions we ask are questions. And, and, and this is something that... Um, would provide different answers to what I can say, but this is something that also as educators, um, it's interesting to highlight by, um, you can ask students a question and then ask them, okay, well, how does ChatGPT answer this question? And then go through and then ask students how they would answer the question. And it's interesting the differences that you find. And then also kind of people, um, you begin to understand more the, the limitations of this when it comes to things like the social sciences. So that kind of model where nobody is doing anything, <laughs> right? That um, AI is doing the research and AI is doing kind of the evaluation of the research is not something, right, that, that I see as on the cards, at least not in a way that would advance um, knowledge in a meaningful way. But if we think kind of more broadly here in terms of, um, what this means for us. I think this is important. It's important to be aware that um, we are kind of being pushed in a particular direction. Right? You might think about platforms that you're very familiar with um, when you want to go and watch a film or a TV series or you listen to music, right? You're being kind of directed towards particular um, products like kind of these kind of um, popular cultural artifacts, right? That um, are, are seen as things that audiences would want to see. But that also has a cost in a sense that you're no longer going to just like encounter things um, by chance, <laughs> right? The way that you might have before. And so in terms of kind of creating a, um, not just digital space, but kind of you might think about the impact on society as a whole, is this kind of pushing us all <laughs> in a particular direction of kind of consuming things that are all more or less the same. Do you believe that AI will lead you to inclusivity, sustainability, and diversity among people's entities? The question, though, that you asked is a little bit bigger, and I think it's it's interesting here. You're you're bringing in kind of sustainability and inclusiveness. Now, there are some who argue that um, these technologies contain or provide powerful tools for things like conflict mitigation or conflict resolution, potentially even peace building, right as I mentioned earlier, right, you have kind of more kind of access to broader um, pools of data and ability to analyze more data. You could have early warning systems, right, about conflicts. And also you could have systems that mediate some, or you have tools to mediate some of the polarization that you are seeing on social media as well. Sustainability, I think, is a, is a more difficult question, um, in part because, like most things in our world today, um, these, particularly like if you think about large language models, um, they demand energy, right? They demand significant computational power. And you already are beginning to see a recognition of this in terms of 
countries beginning to look at supply chains as not just a way to get products to market in a classic liberal sense, but looking at them through a security lens and thinking, wait a second, <laughs> right? What are the implications of this for our national security if we don't have access to semiconductor chips? And as these tools um, require the ability to kind of analyze or compute more data, you require more and more powerful hardware, you require more data centers, and these data centers require a lot more energy, right? And so some have pointed to the environmental costs of things that we see as costless, right? So you might think about, oh, well, if you save something to the cloud, um, the cloud doesn't really hurt the environment because you can't see it where you are, but there's actually a physical data center somewhere, right? Where as, as more and more of this data is being produced, um, it does increase energy demands in the context of a global climate crisis that we are encountering, right? So on the one hand, earlier, your viewers might be thinking, wait a second, you gave me an example, you gave us an example of how artificial intelligence can help um, provide solutions to and a better understanding of climate change. But now, right, we're seeing on the, the flip side that AI requires significant computational power and also is creating, in a sense, this new um, additional demand on energy today. So that's that's one of the big questions that that need to be answered going forward if we're going to think seriously about sustainability. Also, as I mentioned, with inclusivity, while AI can be a powerful tool for um, conflict risk, is also weaponized by those who would seek to foment and create conflict, right? Sometimes this is simply algorithmically um, you might have an intercommunal or an intergroup conflict um, escalate through kind of the content that people want to see on their feeds, which is kind of increasing <laughs> in um, extremist um, content as this kind of crisis escalates. But also, you might have um, malicious actors putting their thumb on the scale and seeking to incite conflict or worsen conflict through disinformation or the spreading of AI-generated images or AI-generated video that might suggest something happened that did not even occur, right? So this is why you see so much focus um, internationally now on artificial intelligence, because it's not there's not an easy answer to this. And this requires um, both flexible regulatory instruments that keep the space open, keep enough space open for innovation and potential progress, but also regulatory instruments that can address these very real <laughs> and very scary um, things, right, that, that are emerging, these new new phenomena that are emerging that, that a lot of publics don't really have a lot of knowledge about and therefore can have a very, have a disproportionate impact on societies. Professor Christopher Lamont, Deputy Head of Program for Artificial Intelligence and Global Governance from the Global Governance Institute based in Brussels, Belgium. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. This is Dr. Rayron Del Rosario, that's the Global Affairs Insider. Follow us to our next episode only here in IPDCI News Channel.